to Sri Ramakrishna, the embodiment of all religions, the Supreme God incarnate. Let us pray to Him to lead us from the unreal to the real, to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge, to lead us from death to immortality. We have been studying the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna is the spiritual master guiding all the spiritual aspirants in whatever way they are practicing religion. So, anybody who is sincerely pursuing spiritual path will find tremendous inspiration from the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna himself practiced and realized and concluded that religion is realization, it is being and becoming, it is the manifestation of divinity already in everyone. Religion means to be intensely practical. So, the foremost quality required for the spiritual aspirant is that he should be very sincere and earnest, then it is easy to go smoothly in the spiritual path. All these spiritual ideas have been given in graphic details in all our sacred scriptures, Upanishads. It deals with spiritual knowledge as Lord Krishna says in the 
भगवद्गीत अध्यात्म विद्या विद्या नाम आई एम द स्पिरिचुअल नॉलेज सो ए पर्सन हु इज ट्रैवलिंग इन द स्पिरिचुअल वे should definitely reach the abode of god and that is the way unless you go in a spiritual path how can you realize the truth if you are not spiritual you will not be able to realize the truth you will not be able to overcome sufferings in the life and you will not really experience true peace and happiness so it is uh, very important for us to understand clearly the message of the upanishads and apply them in actual life understanding and application are both equally important without understanding you can't apply so before application you should know what you are doing exactly then only you get the desired result well the literature is so vast so many ideas have been given in the scriptures and so many interpretations commentaries have come up so if you are not following it properly then it may lead to a kind of confusion and uh, you may not be able to move progressively in the spiritual path so even though there are so many interpretations we should have clear mind to understand the things in a proper way and it requires an illumined spiritual master and here we are really very fortunate to have shri ram krishna for this purpose so with that deep yearning to realize the truth you study the gospel of shri ramakrishna you will see how tremendously he feel peaceful and happy though there are so many interpretations though they seem to be contradictory but really they are all different stages for different grades of people so that is the principle we should know according to swami vivekananda what is the essence of 
the teachings of Vedanta. What is it? Quintessence. Swamiji has said in one word, oneness. Oneness. One life throughout. That is the quintessence of the teachings of Upanishads. Vedanta means the teachings of the Upanishads. The spiritual knowledge is called Vedanta. It doesn't ask us to retire into forest, which is highly impractical for many people. But then, is there no way for them to go into spiritual way, there is a way. It can be practiced by everybody, howsoever they are very busy in their lives. It can be practiced. What is needed is you have to prepare your mind. You must aspire for it. Without aspiration, you can't get spiritual illumination. So, the Vedanta philosophy is not simply theoretical. It is immensely practical. We find Lord Krishna teaching that philosophy to Arjun and the doctrine standing out most luminously there is one of detached action or work amidst utter calmness. There is a technique of work. You must be tremendously calm while doing your job. Since the Vedanta philosophy preaches oneness of existence, the difference between any two lives is only one of degree and not of kind. What could not be expressed in millions of verses has been expressed by Adi Shankaracharya in half a verse. He says, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mithya Jeeva Brahmaiva Naparaha. Most significant statement. The whole truth has been given here. It has been revealed. You have to realize it. Which means Brahman alone is real and the world is unreal. Every being is none other than Brahman himself. Apparently, the statement is contradictory. However, this seeming contradiction has been well reconciled in the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna says in chapter 4, Ajopi sannyavyatma bhutanam ishwaropi san prakatim swamadhishtaya sambhavam yatmamayaya. Though he, the Lord, is in reality birthless, 
he is born as it were how with the help of his own power atma mayaya the root from which maya is derived is ma ma means to form or to build originally it meant the capacity to forms yoga maya is a creative power by which universe is fashioned by god god is thus both efficient and the material cause of the universe which is but the projection or manifestation of himself the world is an effect of god who is the cause of all causes since everywhere the cause is more real than the effect the world is said to be less real than god the cause hence despite the fact that the world is but a manifestation of god he himself is more real as the cause and the world is less real as the effect in other words while the world coming out of god and ultimately dissolving in god is transitory god being the substance from which the world comes into being is ever existent in the statement brahman is real and the world is unreal the word real means permanent or nitya and the word unreal means temporary or anitya shankarachari himself defines real that is sat sat means real as that in regard to which our consciousness never fails and unreal asat as that in regard to which our consciousness fails thus we find there is no contradiction between the two parts of the statement In chapter six, Lord Krishna says, "Sarva bhuta stamatmanam, sarva bhuta ani chatmani, ikshate yoga yukta atma sarvatra samadarshana." He who self is harmonized by yoga sees the self abiding in all beings and all beings in the self. Everywhere he sees the same. though in the process of attaining the vision of the self we have to withdraw from external things and separate the self from the world when the vision is attained the world is drawn into the self on the ethical plane this means that after we have become completely detached from the world we must return to it in other words when the sense of separate finite self with its hopes and fears likes and dislikes is destroyed forever and the knower of brahman is firmly rooted in sameness then we can return to the world and serve all creatures as manifestations of god a man of realization coming to serve all creatures feels immensely joyful the joy that he gets when he sees the supreme lord 
in samadhi state. Sri Ramakrishna, in the course of his sadhana, plunged into various religious practices as enjoined by the scriptures, including the Gita. Now, how Sri Ramakrishna explains the oneness of Vedanta? It is very fascinating. He explains the oneness on the basis of his own realization. He says, very simple example, but most effective meaning. He says, as the water and its bubbles are one, for the bubble, where did it come from? It did come from water. It has its birth in water, the bubble. It floats on water and is ultimately dissolved into water. It had its birth, it died, again it comes up. So, the Jivatman, the embodied being and Paramatman, the supreme being are in essence one and the same. Just as the water and the bubble and its bubble, they are one and the same. The difference is only in the form. The, you, you differentiate because of, of the bubble, otherwise it is water only. But water in the form of bubble, not separated from water, it cannot exist just as the sun and his rays. All the rays are inseparably connected to sun. So, the Jivatman and Paramatman are in essence one and the same. The difference is that while one is finite and small, the other is infinite. While one is dependent, the other is independent. The metaphor of the bubble and water wonderfully expresses the relationship between Brahman and the world as that of cause and effect, thereby reconciling the apparent contradiction in the statement of Shankaracharya. Sri Ramakrishna has further said, all these sayings are in the gospel. The absolute Brahman must not be considered apart from the world and the soul. The three between them form one, three in one and one in three. Absolute Brahman, Jagat and the soul. They are three in one and one in three. Sri Ramakrishna gives the example of bilva fruit. Let us take a bilva fruit. Let the shell, the seeds and the kernel be kept separate. Now suppose somebody wanted to know the weight of the fruit. Surely it would not do to weigh only the kernel of the fruit. The shell, the seeds and the kernel are all weighed with a view to knowing the real weight of the fruit. No doubt we reason at the outset that the all-important thing is the kernel and not the shell or the seeds. In the next place, we go on reasoning, saying that the shell and the seeds belong to the same substance to which the kernel belongs. 
at the first stage of the reasoning we say not this not this thus the absolute is not soul not the finite individual soul again it is not the world either the absolute is the only reality all else is unreal that which is constantly changing is called unreal at the next stage we go a little further we see that the kernel belongs to the same substance as the shell and the seeds hence the substance from which we derive our negative conception of the absolute is the identical substance from which we derive our conception of the finite soul and the phenomenal world your relative lila must be traced to that very being to which your absolute nitya must be traced now lord krishna says in the bhagavad gita chapter 11 mat karma kran mat paramo mat bhaktaha sang varjitah nirvairaha sarva bhuteshu yas samame ti pandava lord krishna says he who does work for me he who looks upon me as his goal he who worships me free from attachment he who is free from enmity to all creatures he goes to me the gita thus gives us not only a comprehensive philosophy brahma vidya but also a practical program yoga shastra our world is a spectacle to contemplate it's a field of battle only for the gita improvement in the individual nature is a way to social betterment this verse brings out a predominant teaching of the gita we must carry out our duties how with detachment directing our minds to god and being free from enmity towards any living being in other words whatever our vocation and character whether we are creative thinkers contemplative poets or ordinary men and women if we possess the one great gift of the love of god we become god's tools god's instruments the channels of his love and purpose when a person becomes attuned to god and exists only to work according to god's will his life's purpose is achieved the natural law is that we are bound by the results of our action as you sow so you reap every action has its natural reaction and so is a source of bondage committing the soul to the world of becoming and preventing its union with the supreme through transcending the world what is demanded is not renunciation of work but renunciation of selfish work the wise see one god in all beings and develop the quality of equal mindedness which is the characteristic of the divine when one self in all beings is seen freedom from selfish desires and love for all arise when these qualities are manifested our devotion is perfect and we become god's sown instrument our life is then guided not by the force of attraction and repulsion friendship and enmity pleasure and pain but by the single urge to give one self to god and therefore to the service of the world which is one with god this explains what lord krishna says ye tu dharmyam ritam idam yathoktam paryupasade saddhadhana mat parama 
तोस्ते दीव दिने प्रिया Chapter 12, Lord Krishna says, those who with faith holding me as their supreme aim, follow this immortal wisdom. Those devotees are exceedingly dear to me. Thus the Gita holds the view that wisdom is not exclusive of devotion to God and desireless work. It insists on the unity of life or spirit which can't be resolved into merely philosophic wisdom, merely devoted love or merely strenuous action. Work, knowledge and devotion are complementary, both when we seek the goal and after we attain it. The Gita reconciles <coughs> the different systems and gives us a comprehensive philosophy and practical teachings which are not local and temporary, but are for all time and all men. It doesn't emphasize external forms or dogmatic notions, but insists on fundamental principles and great truths of human nature and being. Narendranath, subsequently known worldwide as Swami Vivekanand, was not in the habit of accepting any word of even his master, Sri Ramakrishna, as gospel truth. Rather, he would accept it only after critical verification. As he had exceptional insight and intellect, he could appreciate the real value of what the master expressed in words, often having a hidden meaning. One incident happened in the year 1884. Sri Ramakrishna was explaining to his devotees the cardinal tenets of Vaishnavism. In course of explanation, he said, the religion enjoins upon its followers the practice of three things, relish for the name of God, compassion for all living creatures, and service to the devotees of the Lord. After a while, when Sri Ramakrishna was in a semi-conscious mood, he said to himself, compassion to creatures, compassion to creatures, then fool, an insignificant worm crawling on earth, thou to show compassion to others, who art thou to show compassion? No, it cannot be, it is not compassion to others, but rather service, service to man, recognizing him to be the veritable manifestation of God. Narendranath Swami Vivekananda was one among those who listened to the Master and it was he and he alone who could find a special significance in this inspired utterance of the Master. He came out of his room and said to others, what a strange light have I discovered in these wonderful words of the Master. How beautifully has Sri Ramakrishna reconciled the ideal of Bhakti with the knowledge of Vedanta. I have understood the ideal of Vedanta lived by the recluse outside the pale of society can be practiced even from hearth and home and applied to all our daily schemes of life. Whatever may be the occasion, whatever may be the uh, vocation of a man, let him understand and realize that it is God alone who has manifested Himself as a world and created beings. He is both immanent and transcendent. It is He who has become all divine creatures, object of our love, respect, or compassion. And yet he is beyond all days. Such realization of divinity in humanity leaves no room for arrogance. By realizing it, a man cannot have any jealousy or pity for another being. Service of man, knowing him to be the manifestation of God, purifies the heart, and in no time 
such an aspirant realizes himself to be part and parcel of God. Existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. The embodied being cannot remain even for a minute without doing any work. All his activities should be directed to the service of man, the manifestation of God upon the earth. And this will exhilarate the process towards the goal. However, if it is the will of God, the day will soon come when I shall proclaim this grand truth before the world at large. Swami Vivekananda said further, I shall make it the common property of all, the wise and the fool, the rich and the poor, the Brahmin and the Pariya. After the passing away of Sri Ramakrishna, Narendranath as Swami Vivekananda actually translated this idea into action. One of the fundamental principles of the Ramakrishna order established by Swami Vivekananda is the ideal of service. Not only for self-liberation, but also for the well-being of humanity at large. Swami Vivekananda pays a high tribute to Sri Ramakrishna. He says, in a narrow society, there is depth and intensity of spirituality. The narrow stream is very rapid. In a Catholic society, along with the breadth of vision, we find a proportionate loss in depth and intensity. But the life of Sri Ramakrishna upsets all records of history. It is a remarkable phenomenon that in Sri Ramakrishna there has been an assemblage of ideas deeper than the sea and vaster than the skies. We must interpret the Vedas in the light of the experience of Sri Ramakrishna. As in the olden times, it was the Lord alone, the deliverer of the Gita, who partially harmonized these apparently conflicting statements. So, with a view to completely settling this dispute, immensely magnified in the process of time, Lord Krishna himself has come as Sri Ramakrishna. Therefore, no one can truly understand the Vedas and Vedanta unless one studies them in the light of the utterances of Sri Ramakrishna, who first exemplified in his life and taught that these scriptural statements, which appear to the cursory view as contradictory, are meant for different grades of aspirants and are arranged in the order of evolution. The whole world will undoubtedly forget its fights and disputes and be united in a fraternal tie in religious and other matters as a consequence of these teachings. These are the words of Swami Vivekananda about Sri Ramakrishna. So, let us try to study Sri Ramakrishna's teachings and make our life blessed. <coughs> Page 785. Sri Ramakrishna said, I asked the captain and said, Too much reading has spoiled you. Don't read any more. About my own spiritual state, captain said, Your soul, like a bird, is ready to fly. There are two entities, Jivatma, the embodied soul, and Paramatma, the supreme soul. The embodied soul is the bird. The supreme soul is like the Akasha. It is the Chida Akasha, the Akasha of con consciousness. Captain said, your embodied soul 
flies into the akasha of consciousness thus you go into samadhi smiling he criticized the bengalis he said the bengalis are fools they have a gem near them referring to shri ramakrishna they have a gem near them but they can't recognize it captain's father was a great devotee he was a subhadar in the english army even on the battlefield he would perform his worship at the proper time with one hand he would worship shiva and with the other he would wield his gun and sword to master mahashay shri ramkrishna said but captain is engaged in worldly duties day and night whenever i go to his house i see him surrounded by his wife and children besides his men bring him their accounts books now and then but at times his mind dwells on god also it is like the case of a typhoid patient who is always in a delirium now and then he gets a flash of consciousness and cries out i want a drink of water i want a drink of water but while you are giving him the water he becomes unconscious again and is not aware of anything i said to captain you are a ritualist he said yes i feel very happy while performing worship and things like that worldly people have no other way shri ramakrishna said to him shri ramakrishna said i said to him but must one perform formal worship forever how long does a bee buzz about as long as it has not lighted on a flower while sipping honey it doesn't buzz but he said captain said can we like you give up worship under the rituals yet he doesn't always say the same thing sometimes he says that all this is inert sometimes that all this is conscious i say what do you mean by inert everything is chaitanya consciousness shri ramakrishna asked him about purna master said if i see purna once more then my longing for him will diminish how intelligent he is his mind is much drawn to me he says i too feel a strange sensation in my heart for you to yam shri ramakrishna said they have taken him away from your school will that harm you yam answered if vidya sagar tells me that purna's relatives have taken him away from the school on my account i have an explanation to give him master said what will you say yam answered i shall say that one thinks of god in holy company that's by no means bad further i shall tell him that the textbooks prescribed by the school authorities say that one should love god with all one's soul the master loves master said at captain's house i sent i sent for the anger narain i said to him where is your house i want to see it please do come he said but he became nervous as we were going there lest his father should know about it or laugh to visitor shri ramakrishna said you haven't been here for a long time about 7 or 8 months visitor answer about a year sir master another gentleman used to come to with you visitor said yes sir nilmani babu let us stop here yeah mm mm-hmm. no the idea is if you if you are showing compassion you feel you are superior and the man 
he is little lower than yourself no you, you, you should not you should not but if you have serve serving attitude you are humble you will not be egoistic so serving uh, always is associated with adoration you you adore him as a god then only your service is uh, accepted if you have to develop that adoration and respect and reverence you must see the goodness in everyone and uh, so that is the way if god is everything that god is everywhere so my pr- spiritual practice should be to serve any being without any hesitation without being proud of i am serving like that no it's a very nice term seva seva serve the disciple serving the guru and the worshiper serving god in fact our ritual worship is nothing but service to god so service always uh, makes you more and more humble if you have right attitude you will be going the spiritual path in a proper way otherwise uh, if your mind is not properly cultured then there is a tendency it may go in a different way there are so many social organizations are there so many people are working and people the politicians also there we are here to serve the humanity they say everywhere then only the, the love comes distance and feel oh poor poor bird it is trying to eat something and you you love to see and you love to if you have got something to give you give also and you love to see how the bird eats that food so that act of uh the expression of love you know you love it that's why the uh, the animals they are quite they are very good in their natural habitat so love them from a distance don't bring them and cage them in the home and lock them up in the room and make them miserable yeah see you may think we may think they are not miserable but if you give a option they love to go outside they don't want to remain in, they, they don't want to remain caged why should you why should you imprison them no the, the feeling should be let them live in their own happy way that's what i mean to say say no some animals i understand not all for example they bring the animals from the wild forest and they put them in uh, in order to give pleasure to the people they bring them and keep them in the zoo just to uh, what is the purpose it's not for the protection of the animal they are doing that it's just to give pleasure to the people who visit they bring them and put them in the cage and terribly they are miserable terribly not that is simple way so see point is where were they are allowed to stay let them live in their own way that's what i mean to say so for example in uh, in bangalore i went to a devotee's home and uh, the devotee uh, when i went there she prepared some uh, dishes and gave it to me and, and he was while he was uh, serving one cat came there and then immediately she began to appreciate that cat look that swami ji that cat is remarkable i have not brought that cat to stay in my home but when i saw that cat just out of my love by seeing that i a kind of love swelling in my heart i put little milk from next day onwards at exact time it comes there to drink the milk even you may fault even the watch may stop clock may stop but the cat comes at the correct time just it drinks and goes away let it go 
That's what I mean to say. Let it go and enjoy the freedom. If it comes, you help it. You, you serve them. Good. You give the food. Do everything. Don't cage them. Don't put it in their home and lock it and go away. That's what I mean. So I am just giving example. So uh, in a the general attitude should be, you may have that loving attitude, but the animal also should feel. So it may love to be uh, away in the greens rather than in the home, in the stuffy air. <laughs> No, that kind of uh, that kind no that kind of uncertainty is there among everybody. Anybody who is going, uh, they may meet with accident. So who is free from uncertainty? Tell me. The whole world is full of uncertainties only. <laughs> Nobody knows what will happen next. We think we are okay, but we are not okay. Really speaking, you become okay when you realize God. Till then, it has no meaning. Any question more? Any more question? All fulfilled. <laughs> All right, we'll stop. <coughs> One more incident I will uh, narrate, then I will conclude today's uh, gospel class. You know, we have got a retreat center in Ganges, two and a half hours drive from here. We had one dog, black complexion, its name was Kalo. So, that dog lived in the monastery, very lovable and very good dog. Then I inquired how that dog came. It's not that we went to a pet shop and bought it. No, we didn't do that. The coming of the dog itself is very mysterious. Once Bhashanji Maharaj was going in a car, every day evening he would go, go around just for fresh air. While he was going, uh, the car was stopped for some reason in a place and before they started the car, suddenly from nowhere this dog came and jumped into the car and sat there. And they tried to ask that dog to go, it was not re it was refused to go, it didn't go. It was showing in his eyes that it wants to remain, it wants to stay with them. They, they can express the feeling. And Bhashanji said, no, we shall, don't, don't push it out, let us take it to monastery. And when they returned, they came with this dog. Since then, it never went out to the monastery. It was living very happily there, it was jumping, going here and, very lovable dog, very, very extremely lovable dog. But it loved its freedom. So, it's not that we should not uh, keep domestic animals in the home. It is not that, that's not the purpose I am telling. Do, uh, you give them little freedom, whatever they enjoy, let them enjoy. Like that, I'm, what I mean to say. Once you bring something and keep in your home, even though you may say, I don't have attachment, you develop that attachment. Every moment you will think about that. What happened to that, my pet? What is it doing? Where is it? It didn't come for food what has happened, etc., etc. Yeah. So, like that. That's true, that's true. The world that comes to everybody, everybody becomes old. You have to. Old age problems are there. Chant the name of the Lord and His glory unceasingly. The mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire, worldly lust raging furiously within. Own name streamed down in moonlight on the lotus heart. Open its cup to knowledge of thyself. O self, drown deep in the waves of his bliss, tasting his nectar at every step, bathing in his name that bought for weary souls. 
Various are thy names, O Lord, and each and every name thy power recites. No times are set, no rites are needful for chanting of thy name. So vast is thy mercy, how huge and is my wretchedness. Who find in this empty life and heart no devotion to thy name? O oh, my mind, be humbler than a blade of grass. Be patient and forbearing like a tree. Take no honor to thyself, give honor to all. Chant and singly the name of the Lord. O oh Lord and soul of the universe, mine is no prayer for wealth or you. The playthings of lust are the toys of fame. As many times I say may be reborn, grant me, O oh Lord, a steadfast love for thee. A drowning man in this world's fearful ocean is thy servant, O sweet one. In thy mercy consider him as dust beneath thy feet. How have I long for the day when an instant separation from thee, O Lord, will be as a thousand years, when my heart burns away with his desire, and the world without thee is a heartless void. Prostrate at thy feet let me be in unwavering devotion, neither imploring the embrace of thine arms, nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence, though it tears my soul asunder. O thou who stillest the hearts of thy devotees, do with me what thou wilt, for thou art my heart's beloved, thou and thou alone. O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness to light, and lead us from death to immortality. May all be free from dangers, may all realize what is good, May all be actuated by noble thoughts. May all rejoice everywhere. May all be happy. May all be free from disease. May all realize what is good. May none be subject to misery. May the wicked become virtuous. May the virtuous reign tranquility. May the tranquil be free from bonds. May the freed make others free. May good be died all people. May the sovereign righteously rule the earth. May all beings ever attain what is good. May the worlds be prosperous and happy. May the clouds pour rain in time. May the earth be blessed with crops. May all countries be freed from calamity. May holy men live without fear. May the Lord, the destroyer of sins, the presiding deity of all sacred works be satisfied. For he being pleased, the whole universe becomes pleased. He being satisfied, the whole universe feels satisfied. <laughs>